how they will find out who they are. That's how they'll find out the answers to what they're looking for. And in the language, it very clearly in the language it tells you that we should not be living the way we are. That we should not be mimicking what the white man has where one rules all. Where a minority rule the majority. The thing is that there's no point in our people having clans. If the only reason you have a clan is so that you can put some beadwork on your ribbon <laughs> shirt or on your gastoa and uh, say, well, I'm of this clan and this is our side of the house. Duh, what else? <laughs> the thing is, the reason you have a clan is because you have a family. And your family needs to survive. Your need, family needs to enjoy what creation has to offer. That's what you have a clan for. A clan is for you to have an opportunity that you as an individual have a place where you can express yourself, share your opinion. That's what that clan is for. That's why in smaller groups of families can discuss issues. No matter how big or how small they can discuss the issue. Once they've come to a conclusion, and then like for us, then the three turtle clans will come together and sit together and talk about this and the conclusion that they came to. Then on the other side you have the three wolves that, who do the same, the three bears who do the same, the different, because we got nine families, nine clans, and this is how we would come back together. And, that, and finally all will come together and they'll keep working, it's a process to finally come to a consensus. One of the things is that they always say, we'll come to one mind. You know, that's literally impossible. You can never come to one mind. You know, I've often heard my grandfather tell people that, you know, he says, I had all these 14 children I raised and everything, I taught them all the same way and everything, yet yeah, there's no two of them are alike. They're always arguing, they're always fighting, they're always disagreeing with each other. They can't come to one mind. But they can come to an understanding. An understanding that they could all work together on. That they can be one in that. And this is the thing. Like when people say, well, it's impossible to come to a consensus. It's hard to get everybody to be of one mind. Well, it's not impossible to come to a consensus. What's impossible is to come to one mind. And that, but this process of the, the clan system helps you to come to a consensus. It helps you to find a formula to agree with each other that you'll be as one. You'll be a united family, united people to take care of what you have to do. And that, so, you know, this whole thing about what's going on in all of our communities, and that is, you know, is, uh, you know, it's really sad. We've got a cancer among us. We've got to stop that cancer. You know, and I told this earlier to others. Everybody keeps saying it's our tradition, our tradition. Well, a story that I like to pass on to everybody is what to make you think about what is a tradition. There's a story I was told. And it says there was this young couple. They just got married. And, that, and now... It was a time of year, it was a time of celebration. And so in celebrating, it's always the way of our people that you put on a meal. And so the young woman decided, well, this is their first year for this, so she's gonna, she's gonna cook. And so one of the things she was gonna cook was a roast. And what she did is she bought a nice sized roast and she cut it in half. And she put the halves in two separate pans and she put it in the oven. And she's cooking it that way. And her husband, who was unfamiliar with this, he says, what are you doing? She, he, he says, why did you cut the roast in half and cook it in two separate pans? And his young wife says, because it's our tradition. She says, what do you mean, our tradition? She says, yes, she says, it's our tradition. She says, my mother did it that way. She always cooked, prepared this meal, and always she cut the ham, I mean the roast, and she cooked in two separate pans. Yes, but why? So the young woman said, geez, I don't know why. I just know it's our tradition. <laughs> so they go see her mother. And they say, Mom, I said, why did you cut the roast in two and cook it in two separate pans? The mother says, 
because it's our tradition. She says, yeah, but what's the tradition? The mother talked about it. She said, I don't know. She says, my mother did it that way, so that's why I do it that way. And uh, so they go see the grandmother. And she says, Grandma, you know, we've been cooking the gross in two separate pans like you did, and we want to know why you did it. She says, because it's our tradition. Yeah, but what is our what is the tradition? You know, what does it mean? And the grandmother says, gee, she says, I don't know. Fortunately for them, the great grandmother was still alive. So they go see the great grandmother. And it says, Grandma, it says, why did you cook, you know, the gross in two separate pans? Because we've continued to cook it in two separate pans. She says, but why did you do this? You know, it's become a tradition. The great grandmother says, I don't know why you cook it in two separate pans. She says, but she says, for me, she says, I didn't have a pan big enough to cook it, so I messed it up. <laughs> but this is what tradition. It was like a monkey see, monkey do. And we carried this on. And the whole point was, nobody was questioning. We're doing all kinds of things without questioning. It's like one of the stories we keep hearing is that, we, as you go to Shuni, when we do Kornhas dolls, we never put a face on it. And now it's everybody says, well, that's our way, that's our tradition. But when you look back, and that, and you can go to different museums and so on, and you'll see all old Kornhas dolls from 500 years ago, 300 years ago. They had faces. But in the last 200 years, our courthouse dolls have no faces. And nobody ever questions how come that is so. All they say is, it's our way, it's our tradition. But when you do the research, you'll find that the idea of not putting a face on the doll comes from the Quakers. And it was the Quaker influence about, uh, um, onto our people that our people don't put faces on courthouse dolls. <laughs> but see, this is what I'm trying to stress to everybody. No matter what you're told, don't just accept it at face value. Start ex exploring, start dissecting. Because in our language, that's what they say, the doctoretan. Dissect, go right inside. And you'll know. You'll know why something is what it is. It's like they say, don't judge a book by its cover. Everybody looks at the cover of the book, and they'll decide if they're going to buy the book or not, by the picture. But if they buy a book because of that, when they read the book, they find out that it, you know, they, they, why they didn't understand. And that, the thing is, you don't have to accept what the conclusion you came to, but at least you know why. You have to know why. To keep going around with a good mind that's really um, being mindless, that's what's going to happen. And you wonder why you can't get out of the rut you're in, is because you've been told not to question. You've been told to do what you're told. And, uh, and the thing is that when you look at our whole culture, we did always have this of way by going using our language to teach. I don't want to call it an oral tradition. It's a way of teaching our children. It's a way of reminding our children. It's a way of telling our children what happened in the past and so they can understand what's going on today and to be able to know what they need to get prepared for as they go into the future. It's all in there. And that's the things I was told when I was young. Anything you want to know, they told us that. And when you're a kid, you don't really understand that until you get older. It's no different than you don't understand really why your grandmother, when she took you to pick medicine, she told you, don't pick those ones right away. Let's look for more. When they found more, then your grandmother, she gathered some twigs together. She made a fire. And then she burnt tobacco and she spoke to the plant and said to the plant, you, I come here asking you for your help, you know, because so-and-so needs your power, your assistance. And, uh, and so this is why I come to you and I show you this respect. 
And so after that, then they pick the medicine, they take it back and make the medicine and give it to the sick person. But the fact is, our ancestors, they did this. But there's no way of knowing if the plants understood you. And for all we know, the plant was probably saying, don't, don't pick me, don't pick me, you might kill me, you know? But, you know, but the thing is, the grandmother, she took the children with her. She wanted to show the children this, come like a ceremony, like this protocol of how you go about this, because what it's gonna teach the children is respect. And that, so when the children get older and start understanding these things, then when they have children of their own, they become parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles, then they'll go through the same thing to show the children, to teach the children what it is to have a real respect, to live a life of being respectful. It wasn't because the plant understood us. It was for the benefit of the children. And if the children understand and respect, they'll respect the environment. They won't be so quick to dump their oil in the water or to, uh, you know, to pollute the land or the air or anything. They'll be more mindful of all of these things and they'll take responsibility to protect it, protect it for their children.